Uh, I'm Fuller, uh, also known as Follower, uh, and uh, this is Lee. Physical computing. Uh, who here is familiar with the term? <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a no. Physical computing is the idea of taking uh, computing power and taking it away from the box. So instead of uh, having a box with a monitor and a keyboard and a screen, you have some other device uh, that looks different and uh, like this may look slightly more friendly. This is a example of a project called Momo. Um, Momo has a, uh, the ability to tell you where to go. Uh, it has a home programmed into it and it finds its way and the way that it directs you is that it tilts its head uh, to direct, point you in the direction that you need to go. This is an example of a, of a physical computing project that uh, is able to create an emotional connection with the people that use it. For example, when was the last time that you saw someone uh, snuggling up to their Garmin GPS device and go, oh, little LCD, how cute you are. But this is the kind of response that uh, physical computing devices can provoke in people. Uh, does anybody here read Hackaday.com? Okay, you've probably never heard of the Arduino before then, so I'll give you a little bit of an introduction. This is the Arduino. Uh, the Arduino is a, a, an example of a project which uh, is designed to help people create physical computing devices. It was originally designed for artists and designers and non-technical users to get into using hardware and, uh, and electronics. It was developed in Italy uh, by a group of uh, people at a design school uh, and uh, contrary to popular belief, it's not actually named after a Italian emperor, it's named after a pub down the road from where they worked. So we'll have a look at some other examples of uh, physical computing projects. This is a project called Botanicals. Uh, anybody here have pot plants? Uh, are they dead or alive? Uh, so one of the problems that uh, these people were looking at was people have pot plants, but um, apparently they don't know when to water them. So with a botanical, you can plug it into, your, into the dirt uh, in your uh, pot plant, and it will tweet you or send you an SMS message when it needs to be watered. And then when you water it, it will tweet you and say, hey, thanks a lot. And, or well, you're, you're referring to plants in pots, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, just, just, just making sure on that one. Yeah, it probably won't work quite so well in your garden. So, uh, although to be honest, uh, maybe you should try that and, and find out. Maybe there's a whole new market for it. Uh, this is a turn signal jacket. Uh, basically, when you're riding along at night, uh, you want to be able to show people which way you're turning. Uh, it has little switches uh, at the end of the sleeves, and you basically indicate which way you're going, and it will send you your lights one way or the other, and hopefully people avoid driving into you. So these are examples of projects where hopefully you'll get the idea that it's, it's no longer about being in a grey box or a black box. It's about taking some input from the world, doing a little bit of processing on it, and then taking some result, whether it's lighting a light or sending a, a text message or, or moving a servo. So the tools that people are using include the Arduino board I, I showed at the beginning, but it's also available in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Uh, this is the Nano, which is a smaller version. The Mega, which is a bigger version, uh, and the lily pad, which you saw in the turn signal jacket. Uh, so the lily pad is a little bit different in that it's designed to be incorporated into clothing and fabric, and it's actually connected using uh, conductive thread, which apparently originates from fencing. Uh, that's the sport, not what people do in New Zealand to keep the sheep in. Uh, the project uh, for the Arduino, all the board files are available under an open source license. Uh, so people have produced clones like this one, which is called the Free Duino. And you can also have uh, bare bones variations as well. Uh, so the, the main chip on the board is a, a chip from a company called Atmel. Um, you can buy it off the shelf. It's probably kind of 2 to $4, depending on which version you get. And uh, because of that, you can start from buying an official board, and that's probably kind of $20 to $30. And then when you create a project, you can then make a standalone version. So that means that you can have just the, the microcontroller itself. The Arduino is a really good case, case study in a uh, successful open source hardware project as well as open source software. Um, despite there being dozens and dozens of different clones of the Arduino, um, they sell 50,000 a year of the original one, something along those lines. 
Yeah, they've, they've sold somewhere north of 150,000 units over the last five years. Uh, so the Arduino doesn't just consist of the board, it consists of a complete environment. So you've got the board, you've got the development environment, uh, which is based on a project called Processing. Uh, it uses uh, Java for the actual software, uh, but what you write in is a, a subset of C and C++. Don't let the Java scare you. Yeah, you'll never have to touch it. Uh, and underneath it is, uh, is GCC, uh, which I think is really cool because it means that uh, the project's open source uh, sort of all the way down. Um, but also, once you learn a little bit at the beginning, you can kind of work your, work your way down through the software stack. And if you run into limitations going through the easier uh, development environment, you can drop down to GCC and assembly if you really wanted to. Uh, an example of uh, the code and, and the language that you use, um, this is the first uh, sketch, which is what they call a program in the Arduino world. Uh, basically, you uh, write, there's two required functions, a setup function that gets run once, and a loop function that keeps on running until the power turns off or the end of the world occurs, whichever comes first. Uh, so watch out around 2012. Um, you don't want to waste extra battery power if you don't need it. Uh, you'll see that it's very similar to uh, C. Um, it's got kind of little bits of uh, JavaScript if you're used to kind of using that. It's a very similar sort of language. Um, you do have to worry eventually about things like types and memory management, but certainly starting off, um, there's heaps of examples that you can use. Um, the other thing that makes the Arduino environment powerful is that there's a lot of third-party library support for it. So that means that your, a lot of your projects can really take a library from somewhere that deals with one aspect of it and a library from another area and then just pull them together with a little bit of glue code. Uh, so you're not limited to just the board itself. Um, there's a whole range of uh, expansion shields that are available. Uh, Ethernet uh, gives you a wide Ethernet connection. Uh, it has a hardwired TCP IP stack uh, on a chip and there's uh, basically a sockets level interface that, that's been written to it and then there's another library over top of that which makes it easier to, to access. So you basically can make a call out um, and to retrieve, uh, make a client connection or act as a server as well. Um, it's quite a powerful solution. You can have up to um, four hardware connections at a time uh, or three hardware connections and uh, as many software connections as you care to implement. Um, and goes down to Mac level uh, access and obviously other protocols you can implement on top. Uh, GPS, which will tell you where you are, um, unless you're inside a building, in which case it won't. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, solutions available. This particular board, you can plug uh, different GPS modules in depending on what your requirements are. You can also have uh, cellular connections. Uh, sending SMS messages, uh, making uh, data connections and, and so forth. Uh, and also uh, microSD, uh, which gives you the ability to have uh, large amounts of storage. Um, so on the Arduino chip, uh, or the chip used on the Arduino, you've got uh, 32 kilobytes of uh, program storage space and 2K of RAM. Um, so no Windows 7 install, but um, you can kind of reduce your, your target a little bit. Um, you can do a lot in that space. Uh, one of the projects I'm showing a little bit later um, is using maybe two-thirds of the available memory, um, and that's a reasonably sophisticated project. So uh, don't, don't let those numbers put you off. It's more like you know, back in the 80s when you could do a lot. Uh, also, Wi-Fi modules. This one's called the Wi-Fi board, um, and uh, it can connect over secured and, and insecured networks, uh, supports up to WPA2 and so forth. So one question you might have is, uh, okay, so if I'm going to get started with this, uh, why should I get started with microcontrollers rather than using, say, an embedded Linux board or a, a plug computer or something like that? Basically, you're going to have a, a trade-off between three factors. Uh, one of them is uh, the cost. You've got uh, the option to, to, to buy an official board, which, as I say, is about $20 to $30. Um, or you can buy one of the knockoffs, which is kind of somewhat less than that. Uh, you might get a more powerful system if you buy, uh, say, a plug computer or something like that. But uh, then you're going to probably be looking at about $100 uh, to start off with. And then if you're wanting multiples of them, there's no way to kind of easily get it cheaper. Um, so the main restriction in terms of, of, of uh, processing power is that you're not going to be doing video and audio processing. 
uh, it's going to be more limited. Uh, so depending on what your project is that you're wanting to do, uh, will determine whether or not you want to, to go for a, an embedded uh, Linux board or, or stick with something that's microcontroller based. So uh, anybody here interested in security? Um, so uh, with, with, with any new development, uh, there's, there's new opportunities uh, for doing research into uh, both uh, positive and negative side effects of, of a new technology or a new use of a technology. Uh, physical computing is no different. It's uh, part of, uh, also part of a concept called the Internet of Things, which is basically the idea that you have uh, millions and billions of, of smart sensors that are connected to the internet uh, that detect uh, particular states and then report back. Um, but again, because a lot of the stuff is hardwired, then that means that if uh, somebody's making a mistake, then it's there kind of forever. So a lot of the issues that you'll run into are the same sort of things that have been run into traditional computer systems, uh, compute traditional websites, but they're in a hardwired solution, so they're a lot harder to, to just uh, upgrade. So for example, the, the uh, Ethernet board I indicated earlier has a hardware uh, TCP IP stack. So the question is, are there any vulnerabilities in that? And to which I say, uh, you should try and find that out. Um, basically, I would be surprised if it was a perfect TCP IP stack because I don't think that's been invented yet. This is a uh, TCP IP stack that when sending HTTP requests uses a packet per character. Well, to be fair, that, that, that's the driver. But yeah, so you've, you've got both the, the hardware level and, um, uh, and, and the driver level stuff as well. Uh, and so, yeah, certainly there's, there's room there to, to, to find uh, ways that it could be improved uh, and potentially uh, risks associated with it. So uh, one of the other approaches that you can uh, do is, is maybe re-implement some uh, old friends in, in new ways. So uh, one of the projects that I uh, looked at uh, was DHCP exhaustion, which seemed like a, a reasonably simple uh, uh, project to start with. Uh, the, the WISNET board, uh, which is the, the wide Ethernet board, allows you to change your MAC address on the fly. Um, and this is the sum total of code, basically, to, to implement DHCP exhaustion, um, which is you know, not really much to it. Steer and awe. Yeah. Um, uh, other people have uh, taken uh, other approaches. Uh, this is from a uh, payment machine in Canada somewhere. Uh, you'll notice just above the, the S of the word skimming, a little board, that's a Bluetooth board. Uh, so basically these people set up a, a Bluetooth link between the handset for a payment unit and wherever they were uh, and uh, were skimming cards off the top. Uh, and it used to be that if you wanted to get a, you know, a custom Bluetooth solution, uh, you'd have to have a whole lot more intelligence than just plugging in some wires. But now you too can you know, take these approaches if you'd like. So uh, another uh, popular activity during the 90s, which some of you may remember, uh, was the whole concept of war driving. Um, you'd probably have a laptop and maybe an aerial and, and the right uh, Wi-Fi card and, and eventually you'd get something uh, running. So, oh, cool. Um, now this uh, stack will uh, implement the same sort of thing for you. So. This has got a, a Wi-Fi board, uh, which does the wireless connections, micro SD that does logging, uh, GPS, uh, which detects where you are, and, and an Arduino board. So uh, let's have a look at this. Uh, well, Lee, hopefully, uh, gets that working. So basically the, the motivation with this was to be able to apply power um, and uh, you probably can't see all the way from the back but this is the actual size unit. Uh, apply power to it, um, it sits there, waits until it gets a GPS lock and then uh, it starts doing a scan uh, for the available networks and then records anything that it finds. Now one of the interesting things that you have working in uh, a cut down environment like this is that some things that you take for granted aren't actually implemented. So one of the, the issues I ran into was, well, how do I keep track of which um, access points I've already had you know, recorded and, and which ones I haven't? And I you know, considered briefly installing PostgreSQL or something on it, but that 
apparently hasn't been ported yet. Uh, so uh, what has been ported is a, uh, an SD FAT library which uh, implements the FAT file system on the SD card. And so by creating uh, a directory path which matched the MAC address of any uh, access point as I accessed it, uh, I could then just check to see if that file existed and hey, you've got a simple on-disk database of, of all the access points. And so uh, then that uh, records it to a, a file uh, and then carries on. And then uh, potentially uh, this could also serve up the data, um, but in, uh, as, as far as I've modified it so far, uh, basically it records the SD card and then you can pull it off onto your own machine. Are we in luck? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Plus, they were a bit harder to fit in your backpack. But yeah, I mean that, that that's totally um, that it's kind of going back to to yeah, like the seventies and eighties where you could actually achieve a lot without a um, you know with without a whole lot of support in terms of RAM and and so forth. Oh, cool. Okay, so um, uh, so this is uh, basically the result of of opening up uh, uh, the uh, the logged file uh, and uh, using a, a pro another project called Open Layers, which does uh, mapping and provides a JavaScript interface and uh, uses OpenStreetMap for the the mapping data. And so basically it's uh, recorded uh, whether or not it's an open network, a WPA uh, network or a, or a wet network uh, with different colored stars to make it look pretty. Uh, and yeah, so that's all produced uh, automatically from, from the log file once you've uh, got it. Now the interesting thing is that in theory, that, that particular page is being served off a server, but in theory, uh, aside from the actual map data, the, da the whole page itself could be served off the module as well, which then gives you the ability to uh, access it uh, remotely uh, or potentially to have the unit upload the data uh, autonomously so it can just uh, sit in your backpack or, or sit uh, at a, in a target area. And this was in case the uh, demo didn't work, but of course it did. when it finds it again. Linux is totally uh, AV, desktop. anybody? <laughs> It's finding it. Okay. So uh, the the next topic, when we get up to it, uh, is uh, software USB. So uh, there's been a few talks already uh, this week, both at. Uh, at B-Sides, uh, and I think there's some more coming up today, uh, about software or, or about USB fuzzing uh, and fun stuff that you can do uh, if you can create your own custom USB device. So a lot of those solutions use a, a hardware USB implementation. Uh, there was a guy in Austria that wrote uh, a software USB implementation called VUSB, which was previously known as uh, AVR USB. 
And uh, basically this guy, apparently in one of Austria's long winter nights, uh, sat down and decided that he'd work out how to implement low speed USB in software. So basically that was assembly uh, level hacking, uh, you know, working out individual clock cycles and managed to get this chip, uh, which uh, only runs at 16 megahertz, to, to actually support low speed USB. So you can uh, implement low speed USB devices. So that's things like keyboards, uh, mice, and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, then uh, I came along and thought that was pretty cool and a few people had kind of used it around things but there wasn't a lot documented uh, and there wasn't an easy way to access it from the Arduino environment so I created a, a Arduino library uh, that wrapped uh, VUSB. So some of the projects that have done keyboard emulation in the past are things like Caps Locker from a couple of years ago when you plugged a USB device in uh, and it would toggle the Caps Lock key on your victim's computer at random so they think that their keyboard is broken. Um, I implemented an example of that called the, uh, uh, that, that, that perform the same technique. Um, slightly more useful is there's a, a project called YubiKey which actually does authentication and it will send in uh, an authentication key uh, when you press a button or something like that, which means you don't have to type in something from a, a two-factor authentic authentication device. So uh, as an example of how you can uh, use uh, the USB side of things, uh, this is a uh, two parts. The first part is a, a piece of Python code uh, and it creates, uses libUSB in the background to create what's essentially a serial connection to, to a device. And then uh, the USB code on the Arduino is this section and basically it reads whatever's being sent over it. Now uh, I can give you a demo of something here. So so basically this here has uh, a uh, Atmel chip in it which is running uh, in the same way as, as an Arduino. Uh, it's got a switch on the back and a pretty light on the front which isn't uh, uh, doing anything at the moment. Uh, when you press the button down it changes into a uh, green light mode, uh, which means that when you press the, uh, the button again, it'll type out my domain name, which is really impressive when you have a decent internet connection and it actually goes there. Uh, but basically the idea is that you can uh, send any keystrokes that you like. So that includes things like on, uh, on a Mac, you can do things like make uh, expose or dashboard appear and disappear. Uh, some of the other projects uh, that, that have been mentioned and, and I think are coming up again uh, later today uh, do things like they'll actually send the content of an exploit or something like that. Um, one advantage with this approach is that basically you need the chip and about four passive components and the actual connector yourself um, and so it's really cheap uh, and really easy to get started with as well. Um, there are downsides to it, they don't, it doesn't work in every device, um, in fact I've got one laptop where it'll work if you plug it into one USB port on one side but it won't work if you plug it in on the other side. Uh, but it's still fun to be actually be able to create a USB device and, uh, and do stuff with it. Uh, one of the other projects is uh, software protection dongles. Um, I uh, won't demonstrate it now but basically you can uh, have a chunk of Python uh, which is encrypted in some way, uh, send it out to the device which will then decrypt it and then send it back. Um, which is really just an example of how you can have uh, an external device perform some function uh, that won't work if it's, uh, if it's not connected. And of course we know how well software protection dongles work in practice. So uh, one of the other aspects is uh, USB fuzzing. Uh, so this is the idea of finding faults in uh, drivers uh, and uh, hopefully uh, exploiting them. Uh, for those who don't know how USB works, essentially uh, when you plug in a USB device, the host says, hi, who are you? And the device says, oh, hey, I'm this device here and gives a vendor ID and a product ID. And uh, how fu uh, fuzzing works, and so normally the, the host would, would add a, uh, load the correct driver and things would carry on happy. Uh, so what you do with USB fuzzing, or at least the, the first stage of it, is you say, oh hi, I'm this device. 
oh, hi, I'm this device. Oh, hi, I'm this device. And then eventually, uh, if you're lucky, the operating system will go, oh, hey, I've got a driver for that. Here, let's load it. Uh, and then uh, because you're not actually that device, if the driver is making some assumption about the way that you work, uh, it'll uh, dislike it. So the question is, does it actually work? Um, well, the answer is yes. Uh, so this is uh, a log taken from, uh, I think it was a Ubuntu 904 or something like that machine. And basically by pl uh, plugging in the device and pretending to be uh, a, a particular IPAC device, the IPAC driver would load and then uh, I think it was a null pointer D reference that it encountered. Now the interesting thing about this was that uh, when the crash happened, basically no more USB devices were recognized uh, and you had to reboot the machine to actually get USB back. And the funny thing was that it, it could actually still do this even if you were just sitting on the login screen, which means there's a whole lot of stuff about, well, why are you making every single USB driver active at the login screen because, you know, you're not going to use half of them there. Um, but it also means that, that it creates a greater uh, attack surface because it means that you don't actually have to only have a, a device that might handle some sort of input. It can be any device because the drivers are potentially going to be loaded already. So um, there's uh, other people have, have done some work on, on that as well. Um, the, the, this is a really sophisticated program that uh, will cause the crash. Uh, it sets the vendor ID and the product ID and then it sits there and waits for you to yeah, plug it in. So uh, Lee is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the USB fuzzing side of things and what other people have done. So just from, from this slide here, you got that IPAC crash from running through the entire Linux USB device ID database. Yeah. 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 So basically there's a, there's a list of known USB devices and so I, um, the, the, code, the, the, the code that didn't just exploit it but actually uh, searched for it went through the whole list and, and tried it out. Um, there's potentially other devices that aren't supported in, on, on other uh, operating systems so you could actually just go through the complete uh, key space on, on that. Sorry about all the AV fail, folks. All right, so a few other ideas, inspiration um, about potential ways that this kind of hardware attacks can be used. Um, how about a pocket uh, RFID data collector in the same way as we've implemented um, why, uh, we're driving here, potentially you could walk around collecting RFID identification tokens or something like that. Much smaller self-contained rig possible than um, sort of hooking it up to a laptop. laptop. Um, similarly with Bluetooth, with the Bluesmith module, um, follower already mentioned the uh, the pin f pin catcher that was in what was that was built. Um, there's a wide variety of other applications for 
Bluetooth sniffing possible. Um, appliance control, did you want to go back to talking yeah. about that? So uh, one of the other approaches uh, that you can do is you might go, hey, um, can I control uh, some sort of mains powered uh, device? And uh, the concept is really appealing, but unfortunately, um, it can also be lethal. So uh, one approach that you can take if you want to control something that's mains powered is you can get these uh, PowerPoint sockets, which uh, are remote control with an RF remote. And so I, I gave a demo where you could actually uh, vote during a presentation as to whether you wanted Christmas tree lights on or a fan light on or, or a lamp on. And uh, it would just send the signal over the uh, RF remote and turn those particular dev devices on and off. Uh, and that didn't require any interaction with mains power at all. Another potential avenue, there's a project to combine the Arduino, um, the Arduino project with uh, Android cell phones. So to be able to control your Android, uh, to control your Arduino-based hardware project from an Android cell phone, uh, there's a toolkit available. Um, and sort of forward thinking, there's, uh, who here has heard the term road apple? Not in the context of horse shit. <laughs> so a road apple is a social engineering attack where you drop USB keys or another piece of hardware in the parking lot of the company that you're targeting. Um, and as people tend to do, people are gonna plug that thing into their computers when they get into the office. So. Yeah, exactly. The what's on this effect, and uh, it's you know, it, it can be as simple as including um, brightshinythings.exe on that road apple. Um, the the where you run into issues is a lot of uh, corporations will have um, USB device IDs whitelisted and only allow those whitelisted device IDs. Fortunately, you can guess what those whitelisted device IDs are going to be just based on like you know what you know people to be deploying in their corporate networks, um, and with the functionality of the Arduino USB stack to be able to uh, spoof device IDs, you can potentially pretend to be one of those and present yourself as a mass storage device. Um, another one that I've been thinking a lot about lately is haptic, uh, haptic inputs and outputs, um, building covert input devices. Uh, if you're potentially going into an area where you're not allowed to take notes or, take, or record video or whatever, uh, you could potentially use um, soft switches, soft circuits um, to build a haptic interface that, you know, when you nod your head records something or when you like tap a spot on your sleeve records, uh, records text based on Morse code, something like that. Um, and thinking about uh, that sort of physical way of bypassing things uh, brings me to a brief interlude. Um, some of you may have seen the t-shirts folks are wearing uh, that say Free Byron on them, the stickers and the buttons. Um, check out freebyron.org. Byron is a friend of mine and fellow Hackerspace member uh, who is currently being detained in Canada for criticizing the security apparatus and security spending around the G20. So um, if you're interested at all in the right to dissent and the right to criticize crappy security infrastructure, you should check out freebyron.org. Back to USB fuzzing. Uh, a little, I'm going to do a little bit of a summary about the current research and uh, then hand it back over to follower. So um, in terms of USB sniffing and rever protocol reversing, um, there's the sort of old and busted USB snoop, which is still workable up to Windows XP, but doesn't work on Vista or 7. Um, it, it is useful, but produces kind of crappy output. Um, Pi USB uh, is useful that, for that as well. And Nick and Furkin gave a talk on Thursday uh, called GoGo -Go Gadget Python, where they did a bunch of pro um, protocol analysis on the USB Snoop output uh, using Python. So that's definitely worth checking out. There's also a variety of expensive and expensive commercial USB sniffers and protocol analyzers out there, but that's not that interesting. We're talking like a couple thousand dollars kind of expensive. So. Um, some other folks that are working on this stuff, Rafael Dominguez Vega gave a talk last year at DEF CON. Um, he built a PIC based USB fuzzing device. Um, Moritz Jodate get, um, has a really interesting presentation covering a bunch of security aspects of USB um, at a protocol level uh, and has done a bunch of software based fuzzing that's pretty interesting. So back to. Last time we switch, I promise. We're in Vegas, so I guess you should, oh wow, there you go, that would have been a good bet.
So one thing to keep in mind uh, is uh, I was introduced to the Arduino about three years ago. Uh, and up until that stage I'd had an interest in electronics but never sort of got into it too much. Um, there always seemed to be a whole lot of stuff that you had to remember and it was like, electricity is like water except when it's not and it kind of goes through a pump and I'm like, what? Uh, but the great thing with the Arduino is it takes uh, what used to be a 100% hardware problem and makes it a 90% software problem and then a 10% hardware problem. And that means that if you're familiar with software then you can kind of get a long way uh, with just writing code and then you can look at uh, things like uh, the little pieces of hardware that you actually need to, to, to learn and pick up that knowledge as you go. The other, just the other big step up with the Arduino from previous microcontroller and hardware hacking platforms, um, the sheer amount of yak shaving that is involved in setting up a lot of other microcontroller platforms is a real barrier to entry for a lot of folks. With the Arduino you download a zip file, install the driver or it's even already installed on, Windows, on, on Linux and uh, you, you're ready to go. Um, it's also a completely free stack, whereas a lot of the other microcontroller environments out there require proprietary and potentially even non gratis <coughs> Cost software. Free scale. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So potentially not non free as in Libra as well as non free as in no cost. So yeah. Uh, so then there's uh, another selection uh, section of things which you can do just because you can. Uh, this is a uh, example of, of one of those things. So uh, you can you can serve up pretty much anything you like uh, when you're doing a uh, when when you're using uh, a wireless uh, or, or wired shield. And uh, so I played for a while with using Python to generate a, a flash file and then serve that flash file up uh, from, from the, the chip. Now the restriction in that case was this was before there was uh, good implementations of micro SD support. And so essentially everything you were serving up had to be served up from your, in those days, uh, 16K of RAM. And uh, so it turned out that Flash was kind of a, a more efficient way of getting some kind of cool stuff doing. So uh, this is a uh, demo of a demo uh, which has a, uh, a Flash file which is served up and then uh, the little grey uh, lines which you hopefully can see uh, are basically uh, have the ability to return uh, the values of analog pins on, uh, on the Arduino. And so the idea with this is that you don't actually have to install any software to play with it. You can just plug it into your machine, um, go to the local link IP address and it will pop this up and you can automatically start uh, doing stuff with it. And in the background it uses a uh, HTTP REST implementation which basically gives you a URL for each uh, digital pin that you want to turn on and off. Uh, so which then means you can also use things like JavaScript and stuff like that. So um, there's a, a couple of other uh, variations of this that, that people have done out there um, which gives you kind of the ability to do stuff. Uh, so we have uh, one last demo uh, which is VNC. Now one of the restrictions is that if you've only got 2K of RAM um, you can't have a particularly large display space. Um, at least that used to be the case. If we uh, bring this all together. So uh, here I've got um, a VNC client and uh, it turns out that the VNC server implementation is actually relatively straightforward. Um, although I suppose I should really say, man, VNC implementation is really, really difficult and it took a really long time to get this to work. Um, yeah, the protocol uh, is quite well documented and uh, will, um, and, and is something that you can kind of generate on the fly. So we plug it in. Uh, this is uh, how a shield and an Arduino fit together. And connect. So one of the things that uh, you can keep in mind with uh, this, and we, there we have it. So we have our 255 pixel by 255 pixel screen which our Arduino is serving up, um, complete with a windowed environment. Uh, and it's currently giving you a, a reading of the analog pins. Um, so those red bars and the numbers represent uh, the current state of the uh, analog pins. Uh, and because they're what's known as a floating input, it will uh, change as, as the screen advances. 
And uh, yeah, so this is an example of uh, if you're needing to get feedback from a device um, that you've installed in a location, uh, you've got options out there for things like VNC or uh, using a web browser to, uh, to retrieve that information. Uh, and again, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that's that's still yet to be done. People are, are finding out what can be done and you know, people say, you know, a few years ago it was like, oh you can't connect a camera to an Arduino and then this camera came out that you could do stuff with. Um, then it was like, oh you can't attach USB uh, devices like, uh, you know, keyboards or cameras uh, to, to a USB, uh, to an Arduino because it, do, it can't act as a USB host and then a USB host chip was released and someone who created USB host shield and they're currently working on getting that to do uh, P2P communication communication with uh, cameras so you can take photographs and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, if it's a field where you like to do things for the first time, there's, there's heaps of space there. Um, there's, there's heaps of uh, opportunity for doing cool hacks. Um, if that's what motivates you, I'm sure it doesn't. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was in case the VNC demo didn't work. Uh, so uh, that pretty much uh, covers uh, uh, the main stuff that we wanted to, to talk about. We've got a few minutes if uh, we want to get any uh, questions or um, you can talk to us in the Q&A room later. Did you have anything else there? No? Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks for your time and we can see you in the Q&A room. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, with your war driving group, uh, can you talk to the relative power consumption between using that and the laptop? Um, well, the, uh, when I was, uh, so the question is, uh, what's the power consumption of, of the war driving uh, rig? Um, so this was running off four uh, uh, AA batteries um, and that does quite, quite happily for quite a long time. Um, and so yeah, now the other thing is that you can also reduce the size of this quite a bit. These are just using the standard shields. Um, if you wanted to create a custom PCB, um, then you could reduce the size of it probably to, to, to maybe, probably you know, kind of half, size. yeah, also. Cool. Okay, thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>